He does listen to a lot of people, but the person he listens to is the inner voice. And we see it in these rallies, which are a particularly undisciplined form of communications. Look, think about it. Two thirds of the American people think we're going in the wrong direction. He leads on the issue of who's better on the economy, who's better on inflation, yeah, who's better on poll. immigration. That That's all, all good numbers for him. And yet this race today, he's behind. And why is he behind? Because he is making this race about things other than the three big issues in this campaign, the economy, inflation and, and immigration. And, you know, he can go out and, and, and touch on those things, but he will say something incendiary or something will pop up dismissing Medal of Honor winners, uh, you, you know, saying the economy is not a major issue. Uh, he obscures his message because he's fundamentally undisciplined. That's Carl Rove talking about Donald Trump needing to focus on issues, not insults. Like Rove, a lot of Republicans feel compelled to say that because of this. Have you heard her laugh? That is the laugh of a crazy person. That is the laugh of a crazy. It's the laugh of a lunatic. Have you heard it? You know, they prohibited her. They prohibited her for laughing. I, I've, you know, I've been waiting for her to laugh because as soon as she laughs, the election's over. But we're winning by a lot in Pennsylvania. I think the fracking got her. Wait, is, does Donald Trump laugh? I, have I, we heard Donald Trump? I don't, I don't know. Anyway, Senator Lindsey Graham also wants Donald Trump to find discipline. Here's a senator appealing to Donald Trump and what may have inspired it. I don't look at uh, Vice President Harris as a lunatic. I look at her as the most liberal person to ever be nominated for president in the history of the United States. The nightmare for Harris is to defend her policy choices. Every day we're not talking about her policy choices as vice president and what she would do as president is a, <clears throat> is a good day for her and a bad day for us. President Trump can win this election. His policies are good for America. And if you have a policy debate for president, he wins. Donald Trump, the, provo uh, the provocateur, the, uh, the showman, may not win this election. So I'm looking for President Trump to show up in the last 80 days to define what he will do for our country. That's what I would focus on, policy. Yeah. Policy is the key to the White House. I mean, I read a, a so-called Republican who Ronald Reagan didn't like, by the way, and she didn't like him, but she got credit for being this Reagan speechwriter, highly overrated. I don't know anything about her. I don't know her. Treats me badly, but that's okay. She called it wrong. She's called it wrong now for about eight years. But she said one thing that got me. She said Kamala has one big advantage. She's a very beautiful woman. She's a beautiful woman. So I decided to go back and reread the clause. I'm not saying he's, uh, but I say that I am much better looking than her. I think I'm much better. Looking. Much better. I'm a better looking person than Kamala. No, I couldn't believe it. She said, you know, I had never heard that one. They said, no, her biggest advantage is that she's a beautiful woman. I'm going, huh. I never thought of that. I'm better looking than she is. <laughs> um, <clears throat> he's referencing um, Pulitzer Prize uh, winning columnist for The Wall Street Journal, Peggy Noonan, uh, who anyone who's ever been involved in politics certainly knows Peggy Noonan, uh, as I'm sure Donald Trump does as well. Let's we are back. This is a live shot of President Joe Biden inside the convention hall um, where he will give remarks. We had that live picture up of his landing at O'Hare International Airport. He got on um, helicopter Marine One and took a short chopper ride over to Soldier Field and then a brief motorcade to uh, the convention hall, and there he is looking at where he will deliver this speech that we have been talking about tonight. Mike Mamaly, are you close to where he's standing? 
Yeah, Nicole, viewers may have noticed that every time you spoke with me, I was inching closer and closer <laughs> to the stage. And now you can see that the First Lady is actually at the podium right now doing that walkthrough. It's an important opportunity for her to, to get a sense of the room, to look at uh, the crowd as she will be seeing it in a much fuller capacity tonight. Now, the order of the program as she does her testing, mic test, one, two, three, from Dr. Biden, uh, will be for her to make some remarks. And as we understand it, she wants to speak most directly to those Democrats who did remain loyal to her husband. Mm -hmm. uh, we remember that handwritten note that she posted uh, to Twitter after her husband made the decision to step aside. And now we do see President Biden stepping closer to uh, the podium himself here. And at some point, I'm going to get the uh, uh, the shouting voice, give up the golf voice here to see if we can get the president to maybe answer a question or two. But they... Mr. President, Mr. President, is this a bittersweet moment for you at all? Mr. President Dr. Joe Biden saying this is a memorable moment, not a bittersweet moment here. And think about this, Nicole. This is the 13th Democratic convention that President Biden has attended. He has been to every Democratic convention since he was even too young to serve as the U.S. senator when he was running you, in 1972. He only missed the 1988 convention because he had suffered those aneurysms. And so he's been the headliner in a 2020 convention that was radically altered because of COVID-19. Uh, he spoke in very prominent roles in 2008 and 2012 as the vice presidential nominee, and at other times supporting good friends of his, like John Kerry in 2004. Uh, this is obviously going to be a convention unlike any other, and this is something that he's been working very closely with his advisors on over the course of the past weekend uh, at Camp David to make sure he's striking the right tone. This is something he does uh, feel very important as part of his legacy, making sure that his vice president succeeds him uh, as the next president of the United States. Mike Memley, I heard from someone um, who's spoken to him recently that he's doing great, that he feels, um, um, you know, all the pain that anyone would feel in, in sort of abandoning a, a run that he very much maintains was winnable, um, but that his successes as president are resounding, the hostage release, um, the ability to focus 100% on his final months in office um, and, and seeing the reception of his hand-picked successor. Um, what's, what's your understanding of, of sort of the, the, the mixed emotions um, that he's feeling on this night? I think one of the most interesting parts of, of seeing him over these last few weeks is the way in which it seems like a burden in some ways has been lifted. Mm -hmm. One of the things that has been fascinating to me covering him over these last three and a half years is the ways in which the office that he aspired to his entire adult life, the presidency, really almost made it harder for him to practice the kind of politics that made him so successful. The bubble of the presidency made it hard to get that touch and feel with ordinary Americans. Uh, the obligations, the uh, really impediments of maybe being able to speak as mind as freely as he used to, even as vice president, uh, maybe took away some of that common touch, that common feel. But what we've seen from him since he's made that decision not to seek a second term uh, is him feeling much more free to speak his mind, to uh, frankly make fun of himself in ways that he wasn't always able to do. And one of the things I've been hearing from, from some Democrats is, where was that Joe Biden for the last three and a half years. We would have maybe liked to see a lot more of that President Biden. And I think uh, for the next six months, we will see that. Uh, aides have told me that he's going to take some time. He's going to cede the spotlight uh, to Kamala Harris for the rest of this week. He's going to be spending some time in California huddling with his close advisors who have been working to really build a plan to develop ideas, what he can still accomplish uh, through legislation, through executive action, especially through foreign policy, where he does have a wide amount of latitude. You heard a question maybe uh, about the hostage talk and potentially a breakthrough in some of these negotiations uh, between Israel and Hamas. That is a part where he can certainly continue to burnish his legacy. I was uh, trying to get uh, Jeff Zients to join me on the air, the White House chief of staff. He was just uh, to my left here earlier. Uh, he, he declined the opportunity even for you, Nicole, uh, to appear live <laughs> on your show. Uh, but he has been at the tip of the spear in trying to develop this plan and to make sure that this president can end his presidency with uh, has a lot more work to do and he's determined to do as much as he can while he's still in this office. You know, Claire, as, as Mike is, is sort of um, talking about about the strategy and all of the um, latitude that and, and I and I, you know, I open the hour this way. You know, the Biden Harris Walls political phenomenon is unprecedented, unprecedented in American political history and the opportunity they have um, him now as, as sort of her validator. 
um, and as a surrogate for her is is part of why you know Trump's son has been blotted out, right? He, he can't get any oxygen. They're 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 almost too big of a story, the three of them together. What he did and the fact that Trump is still sort of spiraling, can't can't wrap his brain around it, is still tweeting or, or wherever he posts things, um, talking about it. In a, in a way that is so detached from the reality of this moment for the Democratic Party. Yeah, I mean, Trump keeps saying at his, at his shrinking rallies that, um, that Biden hates Kamala Harris. Well, I mean, this is just another example of where Trump tells America, hey, you don't see what you see, because it's pretty obvious they like each other a lot. And it's pretty obvious that they're a great team. And, you know, and I think another thing we have not talked enough about in terms of Joe Biden, he's, he gets credit for so much. Uh, he became vice president because of his mastery of foreign policy. I think, truth be told, I think Barack Obama knew he needed someone who was really strong in that area. This is not something that he had really specialized in for that long a period of time compared to Joe Biden and his knowledge of the world and world leaders, but also the people he surrounded himself with. I mean, he has an incredible cabinet. They have done really good work. There have been n no scandals. No one's been arrested. No one's been convicted. No one has been um, charged with, with, with criminal conduct. And, you know, the list is long in the Trump administration of people who were charged <laughs> with criminal conduct. We don't even have time in this segment to go over all the people that were charged with criminal conduct in the Trump administration. Yeah. Uh, Joe Biden knows how to pick people around him. And I think when he picked Kamala Harris, he knew what he was doing. And I think he's proud of that selection. And I think you're going to see that pride tonight. Yes, now, former special assistant to President Biden and former director of message planning, Megan Hayes. Also with us, former advisor to George W. Bush and John McCain and the creator of the circus, Mark McKinnon. It's great to have both of you here live in person <laughs> on set. Megan, there is this recognition that Hillary Clinton in many ways paved the way for what we're seeing now with, with Kamala Harris. But are there lessons from Hillary Clinton that Kamala Harris, do you think, is applying as you see it or should? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that when you have, when you are a woman, there are many challenges that you face, as you probably have re recognized in the media Never. industry <laughs> as well. So she doesn't need to go out and state it. And she also, like, Secretary Clinton ran in 2008, shattered more glass in the ceiling, put more cracks there than again in 16. And I think that the, the vice president is learning from those mistakes. Again, also learning of how... Secretary Clinton ran against Donald Trump and taking some of those mistakes and running her campaign very different and very disciplined right now. And I know it's been a short campaign, so it can be more disciplined. But I do think that the vice president is taking lessons from Secretary Clinton. I think it's only going to make shattering the glass that much more exciting. Yeah, Politico notes that unlike Clinton, Harris, um, Mark doesn't want to focus on gender as much as she wants to focus on her experience, her upbringing, her prosecutorial chops, right? And in interviews with two dozen elected officials, consultants, Harris allies, nearly all of whom were women, I should say. Um, this is what they said. Uh, they identified Harris's strategy as a bet that swing voters are prepared to vote for a woman for president, but care far more about her record and platform, not how her run will feature in history textbooks. They compare it more to a, a kind of Obama strategy. He didn't talk all the time about I would be the first black president. 100 percent. I mean, I, I learned a lot more, and I think Kamala Harris did, from losing campaigns than winning campaigns. And, and she's going to stand on the shoulders of Hillary Clinton tonight. And this week, uh, when she takes the nomination, and it, it, she, I think it's a very smart strategy not to make gender the center point. People get that. I mean, that's obvious. And so, what they want to know is what your credentials are. And so, um, you know, I think that that this is a gold watch night week for uh, President Biden, but also for Hillary Clinton too. She made this possible. Absolutely. So, so what does she do? Um, there are doubters out there, and they may not say it out loud, but talk to any woman who has who's in business, who has a job, who has a life, and they will talk to you about the slights that they hear. Donald Trump says them out loud. Her concern more is the voters who may hesitate. Is there an answer for that? No, I don't think so. I think she goes out and runs the campaign she wants to run. I think that Donald Trump saying these things out loud actually help her and benefit her. People don't want to hear those things. It's discouraging to women. Women definitely don't want to hear it, and it turns people off. It's so negative. And I think she just continues to go out and draw the contrast between her and the former president and lay out her economic policies like she did last week. And I think she 
you know, people will continue to gain enthusiasm for her and get to know her more. Yeah, one of the things you write about, Mark, in Vanity Fair is the joy, right? And um, I think that there's been a hesitation uh, to for women to be too seen as joyful, that they're not serious enough, right? But there's something different about the way this feels. I don't know how long you've been in town or how many people you've been able to talk to, but how do you expect it to factor into what we see on the floor? I think the it's MC? a huge factor, and I think it's been pent up since 2016. Mm. And uh, you, you, I just think that there is a there is a... Peggy Noonan said it best. I think she said that it's not so much that Kamala Harris created a movement as the movement created her. There's just this pent up desire for uh, a, a woman, a, a diversity, you know, to expand that Democratic tent. And Kamala Harris represents diversity. And she said, you know, she says, vote for me because I'm qualified, not because I'm a woman. But she is a woman. It would be a first. And I think America's more than ready to vote for a woman. The problem with Hillary not winning was not because she was a woman. There was a Hillary problem. Yeah. You know, one of the most popular people in America, poll after poll after poll, happens to be a black woman. Her name is Michelle Obama. <laughs> she uh, She's going to be here tomorrow addressing the DNC. And, and, of course, she has that famous phrase, when they go low, we go high, from the 2016 convention. Um, it's a tone we're seeing Kamala Harris adopt. And let me just play a little clip of, of something she had to say. This campaign is about a recognition that, frankly, over the last several years, there's been this kind of perversion that has taken place, I think, which is to suggest, which is to suggest that the measure of the strength of a leader is based on who you beat down, when what we know is the real and true measure of the strength of a leader is based on who you lift up. Yeah. That's what we see as strength. That's an interesting choice of words, I think, because when I hear that, I think there's the human aspect of it, right? About beating people down versus building them up. There was also an economic message, a message about your future in that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, her and President Biden have worked really hard the last three and a half years to build out the middle class, to have policies that really impact the middle class. I know inflation is high, but they're, they're, are, they're making movements here and they're making changes. She laid out an economic policy last week, like I said, in North Carolina. But I do think, look, she's not going to take the low road. She's not going to attack him in the same way. She's not going to compare their looks. She's not going to say she's better looking. That's just weird and really just disgusting comments to be making and she wants to she wants to win because she's qualified and she wants people to vote for her because she's qualified and no other reason so i've asked this question before i've asked it this cycle but i'll ask you again mark because everybody is going to do what you're supposed to do at a convention which is to say positive things to look forward to the future having said that Study after study after study showed that while people said they didn't like negative ads that's what they responded to so can they continue to feel the joy, to, to spread the joy? How do you balance that with the reality of what some people are feeling? Yes, but what they, what they really want is a forward-leaning message, which is what Kamala Harris does. I mean, Donald Trump was one of the only candidates in history I can remember that wanted to go backwards. <laughs> And he picked that lock in history at a time where people were afraid of the future. I think they're ready for the future again. I think they're ready for a joyful, optimistic, uplifting message. I mean, it was a Reagan message. It was a Bush message. that was a Clinton message. That message works over time. And I think she's got a whole new level of joy and optimism that people are just bursting for. And I think that's what's really elevating this campaign. City on a hill, I believe, in a place called hope. We could go <laughs> 100%. on. It's great to see you guys. Mark and Megan, stay right here. The past eight to ten years have been about Donald Trump. Everything has been about Donald Trump. I don't think that the Democrats would have let Joe Biden get as far as he did if it wasn't if the party hadn't been confident that the uh, the, the, the Republicans were going to nominate Donald Trump again, which the Republicans did. Um, the fact that Biden was doing even as well as he did until the very end is testament to the fact that Donald Trump he has a very hard, solid base of support, but it never gets above about 40 to 45 percent, maybe a little more at best. So his weakness is the predicate for our politics going back three now three elections. He was able to surmount Hillary Clinton, a uniquely unpopular uh, opponent, but he couldn't beat Biden. Uh, and, you know, you look at the losses in the midterms, well, he was, or the disappointing results in the midterms, it's all about one thing. It's about that Donald Trump, it, for, no matter how enthusiastic his supporters are, nonetheless, is not a majority uh, candidate. He might win, but he's not a majority candidate. That's all I can say. We're a nation in decline. You know, we were talking about that before. 
my phrases are copied so much, right? I use, I, I use the term, oftentimes in closing, we are a nation in decline. We are a failed nation. And I think it's a beautiful phrase, although I don't like the topic very much. I don't like what it represents, but there's a certain beauty. All of a sudden, all of these candidates, including Republicans, are saying we are a nation in decline, we are a failing nation. And I say, you know, what the hell do they have to copy me for, right? But they have a lot of words that they copy. Many of our words, we were in the plane before coming in, and our people said, we went through a list. I think we're going to release a list. Let's release it. But so many of our phrases, they copy. <laughs> I don't know about the copying of the phrases. First of all, if you're a politician, you want other people to copy your phrases because it, it expands it. But, but to, to, to say we're a nation in decline is, is wrong. It's factually wrong. To say we're a failed nation is factually wrong. It's just wrong. It just so, so for Republicans out there uh, who may want to follow down that trail, let me give you some facts. America is a great nation. And the overwhelming majority of Americans and the people who will be voting for or against you this fall agree with me. America is a great nation. America is a good nation. We fed and freed more people through the years than any other country on the planet. And today, economically stronger than ever, stronger relative to the rest of the world, and richer than ever economically, a $27 trillion GDP. The Dow, higher than it's ever been, far higher than when Donald Trump was president of the United States. Donald Trump says, drill, baby, drill. Some Democrats may not like it, uh, but if you look at the United States and its oil production, the United States has produced more oil this past year than any other country in history. Militarily, far from being a woke military, we are the strongest military power in the world. We're stronger relative to the rest of the world than any time since 1945. Culturally, just, just, just I mean, I could talk about all of America's reach in soft power. Let's just talk about Taylor Swift going through Europe and the economic boom that is for those countries. We're, we're, we're strong politically. We're strong diplomatically. Again, relative to the rest of the world, America is stronger than it's ever been. There just are no measurements that you, 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 can, you can find that would suggest that we're a nation in decline. Our enemies understand we're not a nation in decline. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Again, for Republicans who, as Britt Hume said, has been, they've been following a guy who lost in 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, uh, the, 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 the view, the Trumpism view that America is a failing nation. We're a great nation. Americans are proud of their country. And Donald Trump's always talking about Vladimir Putin and what a great leader he is. You know, our GDP is 27 trillion, Russia's is 1.4 trillion and probably dropping right now. Texas has a higher GDP every year than Russia, the entire country. California, which is supposed to be failing, has the fourth largest GDP on the planet. That's how powerful we are. So I could go on and on. It's just, it's, it's exhausting hearing Donald Trump and other Republicans say we're a failing country, that we're a nation in decline. It's just not true. And you know, Thomas Paine talked about, about uh, sun, sunshine patriots, talked about summer soldiers and sunshine patriots. Well, that doesn't even define what this Republican Party is because it is summer in America, economically. It is summer in America, militarily, again, more powerful than ever. And yet they're attacking us. And it is a, 
It is a strange form of patriotism that says America is only great if one leader is in power. And if that leader is not in power, then America is in decline. The jury system and our court system can't be trusted. Uh, the economy is collapsing uh, and, and democracy is failing. That's what you have with their side. When, when, when I say their side, those who are constantly attacking America. For those of us who are Republican, independent and democratic, who love America, who think America is great, regardless of who's president of the United States, these are pretty good times. And we're going to hear about those good times a few hours from now when the Democratic National Convention begins in Chicago. In now is that Congresswoman Kima Williams. All right. So what's the key here? Look, you know, you cannot take anything for granted in Georgia. That's right. It's been a long fight for Democrats there to even be in the conversation. What's it going to take? So we were counted out in 2020 and we delivered for the first time in 28 years for a Democratic presidential candidate, 28 years. And then we sent not one but two U.S. senators to give us the Senate majority. So we know that it's an uphill battle, but we're also accustomed to being counted out. So we're not following any one poll or any one pundit. We're going to do the work and have the conversations with voters on the ground. Voters care about their freedom to vote. They care about their reproductive freedom. They care about sending their kids to school with the freedom to learn our full and factual history. And we're going to continue to have that conversation with Georgia voters. One thing that victory does for you is it feeds a need to win again, but it also gives you lessons. So what did you learn from those victories, both in the Senate and in the presidency four years ago? What's the secret sauce? And will it be different now without COVID. It was a very different election four years ago. So, but we also had an election two years ago where we sent our Senator Reverend Raphael Warnock back for a full six-year term, and we were told that that would be a fluke, and we couldn't pull it off again. We know that it will be a tough fight. We only won by 11,780 votes. Everybody knows that number because our former failed president tried to overturn the will of Georgia voters. So we know that we have to make sure that we are counting every vote. Our voter protection team has to be on top of this. We have volunteer attorneys in all 159 counties, making sure that when voters turn out to cast their vote, they're actually counted. So that is a big part of this, but also continuing to have those one-on-one -on -one direct voter contacts, because that makes all the difference. So 159 volunteers, are you looking at potentially hundreds of attorneys who are ready to go on election night? If there hundreds are of attorneys already ready to go. So they are trained, we're already filling questions as people are hearing about maybe being dropped from the voter rolls, then we can make sure that we're addressing that in real time leading up to the election so that we don't get surprises on election day. There's a little something going on between your governor, Brian Kemp, and, something. and, and, and Donald Trump. Um, Donald Trump has unloaded on him very recently, maybe, and then maybe a month ago. It set off worries among some of his supporters that that's not a, a smart thing to do, to go after a popular governor of the state. But I haven't seen a lot of things that Donald Trump is doing that are quite smart to winning an election. So, so do, but do you think, at least in this one case, wh whether you say it's picking a fight with Kemp or not, um, is it all just so much inside baseball? Or do you think people are paying attention, voters are paying attention? So the one thing that I know is that even with Donald Trump trying to overturn the will of Georgia voters, even with him actually talking about Brian Kemp's wife, First Lady Marty Kemp, Brian Kemp is still saying he's going to vote for this man. He's going to vote for the man who brags about overturning Roe v. Wade. He's going to vote for the man who stood there on the stage and is lifting up three Board of Elections workers, state Board of Election appointees by the Republicans who are making it harder for Georgians to cast their ballots and get them counted. So, so, so let me ask you if you're worried about Kemp in this sense. He has a vaunted turnout operation. That's how he got to be where he is today. And Trump did lose four years ago, but by only 12,000 votes. My math, which is not usually great, but I had it double-checked, less than two-tenths or right around two-tenths. 11,780. <laughs> yeah, so... Do you worry about Kemp and the fact that he is supporting Donald Trump? 
So I worry about the fact that we have someone running for president who probably won't even accept the will of the voters. That's why I know that it's Georgia Democrats. We have to continue to organize. We have to continue to do the work. We know that there will be a fight for every single vote. We are a battleground state, true and true. That means that no side is going to be way up or way down. We're going to be even throughout this entire thing, and it's going to de depend on turnout. So we have been organizing on the ground. In the first day after the vice president, announcing that she was running, we had over 1,000 new volunteers to the Democratic Party of Georgia. Our donations increased by 320 percent just at the Democratic Party of Georgia. So we are ready to do the work. Our volunteers are energized and fired up. We had 10,000 people at her rally on July 30th in Atlanta and would have put more in if the fire marshals would have let us. <laughs> Congresswoman Nikema Williams, it's good to see you here. Good to see you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.